Operations officer calling from Langley, Virginia. Do you have a Jason Bourne in custody? Yes, I do. Listen, he's an agency priority target. I understand. Welcome to Tone Benders, where we talk with the sonic artists behind our favorite films, series, and games. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I will be your host today. We are coming to you from Formosa Group Stage 2 at their Hollywood facility. We're going to talk about the Bourne trilogy of films. I think they really changed the way films sound, specifically action films. When the Bourne identity came out in 2002, it was something that felt really fresh and new. The fights were invasive sounding. It was an impressive film and achieved tension in some scenes where visually it was just a bunch of people staring at computer monitors. There was action aplenty, but also genuinely romantic scenes and dare I say, a sexy relationship between the two main characters. The film was a huge success. Then The Bourne Supremacy came out in 2004, and although the themes and main character were the same, the style took quite a different approach. This film had a new director, and it was extremely kinetic. The chase scenes were manic in a way that no one had ever seen before. The edits were hidden in whip pans with extreme close-ups, and the sound had to match all this. There were also long fight scenes with no music at all that relied on both sound effects and intense breathing and efforts to keep us on the edge of our seats. Plus, the romance angle from the first film was over only a few minutes into the sequel. It was a thrill to sit in the cinema and be attacked by this story. Then when the Bourne Ultimatum arrived in theaters three years later, everything that was introduced in the second film was taken a step further and felt both perfected and actually kind of further broken purposely in a way, much like the protagonist's brain. Again, there were massive fight scenes with no music, chase scenes that were thrilling, and a hero to cheer for despite his dishonorable past. The third film won an Oscar for sound editing and the golden reel for both dialogue ADR editing and sound effects fully, and it deserved all of these. Today, we are lucky enough to have the Trilogy Supervising Sound Editor joining me for a talk, and we're going to walk into his past on these films. And much like Jason Bourne, his memories are going to be tested today. So let's meet him. We have Per Halberg, who is focused on the sound effects side of things on these films. Thanks for joining me today, Per. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Awesome. Good to be here. So when you first got on these films, what was your first impression when you saw the first, uh, the Bourne identity? You know, it's an interesting story. I think at the time, I remember I went out to a meeting at Universal and I had heard about this film and I met the filmmakers and it seemed like it was a go. And then I met the head of post-production for the studio when I walked back to my car and he said, hey, Pear, what are you doing here? I just met with some people about this film, Born Identity. And he said, why are you doing that? And what that meant was like what he said, he was surprised that I was going to be on that film because at the time, the studio at Universal was basically focusing on Meet Joe Black, I think, and it was another big film that they had going that year, and all the focus was on that, big stars, you know, it was going to be some big blockbusters. So this film was actually made somewhat without anybody from the studio caring about it. Wow. Nobody thought that it was going to be something that it was, you know, it was a sleeper. And it became a sleeper for us, too, because the first time I saw it, it was somewhat unwatchable. <laughs> and then we kept going through recuts, reshoots, rewrites, reshoots again. And it got to the point, you know, after a while, you actually lose perspective. And as a film, I went to the final, or I think it was the premiere, I went to see it, and we had been in that mode we gotta, We just got to finish this thing. We got to get it done. And we've all lo- lost perspective. And I remember sitting in the theater, and about 10 minutes into the movie, I leaned over to whoever was sitting next to me, and I said, do you see that? The audience are watching. They're into it. Because we've kind of we somewhat given up. We just want it to be done. And it was a surprise to everybody, I think, because of that, that it became the hit that it was. I never would have thought that watching it, it 
it seemed like it was, would have been a priority because it was such a great movie. It it seemed like it, you know, but these these things are, I think that if I've ever worked on stuff that was, you know, obviously shot and created by directors, everybody doing all their stuff, but those movies, all three of them, really majorly came together as movies during post-production. Of course, you have to have the idea, all that stuff, right? But they kept being cut and pushed and worked all the way to the last minute. I think for Born Ultimatum, for instance, it was kind of nice because it got recognized in all the post-production categories. Yeah, one for picture editing as well. Yeah, yeah. So the difference between, maybe not difference, the, the change between Born Identity going into Born Supremacy was the director changed. Yes. Do you want to talk about the different approaches that your different mandates you were given from the different directors? So Doug Lyman was the first one and yeah. Paul Greengrass was the second one. Well, and third one. Two very different personalities, both of them amazing personalities and great in their own way, but very different which I think shows in the movies, too. Definitely, yeah. It does. But both interesting to work with. And, and Doug Lyman, you know, he has his thing that he does, and you wonder sometimes, how does he get it together? But he does. At the end, it kind of is always great, right? And Paul Greengrass was a different beast because he came from a background in uh, documentaries. And I think he has a little bit of an attitude, you know, that, you know, I'll go out and I'll shoot a bunch of stuff and we'll toss it up and we'll see what sticks. Because that's how he had worked in his past. Clearly, he had a thought and an idea. But the way of shooting and putting it together was a whole new thing, which I think made the big difference in the second movie and the third movie compared to the first one. Let's talk about the ch- the car chase scenes Specifically in the, well, actually in all three of them, but it, by the time we get to the third one, there's some iconic car chase scenes. Now, if you go back to the French Connection, and I'm sure much further back, car chase scenes have been a big part of Hollywood for a long time. Yeah. But the way that these films came together felt like a, a step forward for the whole idea of the car chase scene. Do you want to, I, I realize you can't remember every moment of every car chase scene, but if you want to talk kind of about your maybe philosophy on how those evolved over the films and how you think doing sound for a car chase scene, what your maybe uh, secrets or tricks of the trade maybe are? Well, I think that a big difference here was, and, and I remember telling Greengrass that we needed to kind of anchor the audience in to the picture and the story in a way that we had not done before. And the reason for that was the way that it was shot, they had a great second unit director and it worked really well with Chris Riles, that was the picture editor. And they, it's really fast and it's moving, the cameras are shifting, it's quick cuts. And I remember at one point I told Greengrass that, you know, we gotta anchor it somewhere because if you you don't have sound, or if we have sound that matches every cut, you're gonna get seasick. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'll show you. And we turned the sound off and we played a bit and he said, yeah, you're kinda right, right? And it's so fast, it's so quick that your eye doesn't pick everything up. And also it doesn't know what is important in this part of the thing. So what we had to do was to kind of, in sometimes cut off on cuts in other places, Maybe decide these three cuts, these fast ones, we have to have something that draw your attention, the audience's attention to a specific thing to kind of anchor them in of what to look at, not just hearing it all coming at you. We had to pinpoint what the audience should recognize and see. And that was not just in the car chases. That was in a lot of stuff like that. But I think we had to be more so than any other time kind of the guiding light or the roadmap, if you will, for the audience to help out, to catch it. If you want to sometime, you should check, check it out, you know, turn it off and play and see if you can catch what actually is happening on the, on the screen and then do it, put the sound back on and you'll see the difference. Oh, that's a good homework assignment for everybody listening. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, there you go. That's a really good idea. I, I actually have found that a lot. When you turn the sound off in action sequences, you, ex- you just experience them so differently. Yeah. And like punches that don't land at all, you see, even yeah. though 
uh, with the sound makes it you feel like you connect. But I love the idea of the sound leading the eye. Yeah, that's a really. That, but that's that's also tricky to do because uh, there's so much going on. Did did you ever feel like if you pulled everything out except for that one sound, did it ever feel jarring, or were you, was that jarring positive in this case? I think I think it's it's moment by moment, and it was you know it was a ton of decisions you know with us, me and Karen working on it. And of course, our crew. And then we go to the stage and you work with the mixers. And then Chris Rouse, the picture editor, gets really involved at that point. Um, on the mix stage. On the mix stage. And he knows every cut, everything, and what his point of view is and where it should be. It's kind of the ultimate teamwork, I'd say. And it was a great team and a great bunch of people. And we kind of loved doing these movies, too. So it was, it was a great experience. And nobody gives up. So if you can push it and push it and push it and make it better and better and better, that's what we wanted to do. Something in the car chase scenes that is uh, a very prevalent sound is tire squeals. They're everywhere. Yep. And uh, did did you do field recording for that or was that? It would, you know, we have an immense library, but every movie deserves new stuff. So, yes, there was a lot of recordings done for that. And uh, everything from in parking garages to whatever else tricks to get it right. But that is, again, some of those things that we talked about. You know, tire squeal could tie three, four cuts together to clarify what's really happening instead of the close-ups when you don't really see it. So that's, that was one of those things that we used to do that. The other great advantage of the tire squeal is it's a high-pitched sound. It's out of the frequency range of the engines. Yes. So you can really push them up. It's true, and it's, it's you know, I see that a lot of times that the biggest mistake really would be to try to play everything all at once. And uh, that might be that you take the engine out, even if it's a close-up, even if it's a big rev, even, whatever it is, but maybe it serves the picture and the moment better to actually... Just take it out. The cleaner you get, the better off, usually. Usually, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. something that I'm assuming you probably did when you were a, a junior sound editor, and every sound editor, I think, ever, when you're presented with a car scene, you get steadies everywhere. And then by the time that goes to mix, those steadies, a lot of the time, just disappear. Yes. And you've spent all this time cutting steadies that no one ever hears. What, what was your use of steadies for your, your car chase scenes? You know, I have to admit that I don't remember exactly how the track looked at the time, but but I think my philosophy has always been, and us as a team, both me and Karen, I'd say, is, and we transfer that, of course, then to the rest of the crew, is less is more. And my theory is that if you go in clean and have a point of view of what should play, if you later are missing something, it's really easy to add to that. But it's really hard if you come with every toy, everything that you could possibly use, and you put it up on a dead stub stage, it becomes a bit of a, you spend all your time cleaning. And I'd rather do it the other way. Start light, start with the things, and be very specific about it. And then later, like I said, if something seems to be missing and you need a little bit of a study somewhere, add that. But at the end, you probably realize that, you know, I didn't need any of it. And I think that's a decision and, uh, you know, you have to be brave sometimes. Yeah, you do. And I think, too, it's one of the hardest things for everybody. And I'm not talking just in sound. I think it's for actors. It's for the composer. For the first, when you watch a movie, you tend to look at your own stuff. And you tend to look at, well, am I, as an actor, am I looking good in the close-up, right? They don't see the film. And, and it goes all the way down to maybe I have somebody in the Foley crew that goes like, well, I didn't hear my stuff. And I think that's one of those key things to know and learn and trust is to be able to see the big picture and not get stuck on sound effects per se or a specific group of the sound effects or whatever. It's always to sit back and watch the movie and be able to determine what's important. And sometimes that is music. It's always dialogue. And then it could be effects. And you, but it has to be a trade-off. It has to be a plan 
And I, I think that that's one of those hardest things to learn. If you're talking about junior sound editors or something, you want to, well, it moved. I better cut something. Well, that's not always what you need. But that's something that you grow into. Well, it takes experience and confidence because when you're younger and you're figuring it out, you see something move and you're like, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't cover that. Correct. And so the, it takes that experience to get to that level to have the confidence to make that conscious choice. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think, too, it's, it's about in the team. We've been lucky that we've been working with people over and over and over again on our team. You know, the new guy, as we still call him, has probably been with us for 20 years. <laughs> I, that's not necessarily true. We have people coming and going and all that kind of stuff. But it's as a team, we've always pushed the idea that we got to trust each other. And part of that is that if I'm talking to one of the editors and I say, I don't need you and I don't want you to cut this and that and that and that, just like you said, people are used to, well, but it's moving, so I better cover it in case. I can actually get agitated or frustrated when that happens because I did say, N do not cut that because there was a bigger plan. And it takes time for somebody when they come in because they have all experienced that phone call when they get it from the dub stage. Why didn't you do blah, 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 blah? And I've always said to everybody, you, you know, if I say that this is the way we're going to go, if I'm wrong and we need to do something about it, you're never going to get that phone call because you didn't do something that I asked you not to do. So it's a trust level, I think. And then... For us, too, which is also important for how we have tended to work, is um, we try to meet with the whole crew pretty much every day. And we like to work tight and close together. And it doesn't mean that we're meeting with the effects guys only. We meet with everybody in the crew. And we talk about the movie before we start. We talk about where we're at when we're into it. And what that does is that final package is going to be much closer, tighter and better because... When we're working away, if you're cutting the car chase, for instance, you know what somebody else is cutting the guns in the same sequence. So you know what they're doing, and we're talking about it. The dialogue people know what the effects are doing, so they know how they should do it and approach it. And that's that synergy to get it. That's what the team, where the teamworks come in. And if you don't communicate and you just have people cutting stuff, it's a lot to sort out at the end. So you want to start with that plan and the idea and make sure that everybody knows what they should do, but they also know what everybody else on the team is doing. And I think that's super helpful. So two things that you brought up in the last couple of answers. One, you mentioned that you want each scene to have a point of view. Yeah. And two, communication is really important. How do you communicate to the other editors what that point of view is? I think we, we tend to sit down, you know, Karen and I will look at a film and we talk it through just between the two of us. And then we bring the crew in, and then we do the same thing. We have everybody there, and we watch the movie, we watch scenes, and we talk about them, and try to transfer our ideas over to, so everybody else has the same one. So it's not like you go off and cut, and you go off and you do this, and it's just a movie. No, it's, it's, this is the movie we're working on now, and this is the scene that we need to have a plan for. And you need to communicate that. It's my, I've always felt like my job is not necessarily to tell people what to cut. A lot of times it is telling what not to do because at the end, you know, that's, that creates this clean, sharp perspective mm -hmm. that we've been talking about. Because everybody can cut, you know, a lot of stuff. <laughs> anyway, it's a, communication has always been a big thing. And that's also, for me, that's what makes it fun. Yeah. It really is. You know, you put me alone in a room and lock the door, I'll go crazy. I, I need to have the people around us. Karen and I have worked together for way too long. And uh, we've, we've been doing this and we keep doing it and we have our crew in. But that's what keeps me keeps me alive is, is that teamwork and all the friendships in a sense. So you've mentioned Karen a couple times. You're talking yep. about Karen Baker-Landers. Yes. 
she mostly handles the dialogue side. Is that how your team works? No, no, not at all. No, I'm mostly, wrong. Okay, mostly tell me she, more. mostly she's a pain in the ass. <laughs> And that's, that's uh, you know, everybody that's worked with us, you know, we have this uh, uh, relationship. We've been doing this a long time together. We're all, you know, we're always having fun. And it's always great. So, yes, we don't divide it up that you take care of that, I take care of this. That would be the wrong thing again. We, you know, that's, then you step away from having two departments that at some point is going to join. Mm-hmm. No, we, we talk about everything. It might be that... Let's say that I might focus more on the gunshots or whatever it is, right? And she might do something else or focus on a foley or whatever. But at at the end, it's always the complete package together and no clear split like that. I, I think that that's, oh, it's a, it's a man and a woman working together. Well, the woman must be doing the dialogue and the guy is doing the sound effects. That would be standard, Right one would think. But no, we've never worked like that. That's awesome. I thought that I read somewhere that that's how it was, but I'm really happy that it's not yeah, how it is. No, it, <laughs> no I'd, I'd say it's never, no, it's never been like that. Right on. So let's talk about another element of these films that I thought was really groundbreaking, which is the hand-to-hand combat. Yeah. So the films, there, there's two scenes in the trilogy that really stuck out to me as long hand-to-hand combat scenes that do not feature music. Right. The way that they're designed, and I'm assuming this started with the picture and you refined it further, is that the rhythm is built through the sound effects. And then in addition to the sound effects, I assume ADR, but maybe it's production, the the breathing and grunts and impact sounds that the actors make. So that like these are edge of your seat scenes. Right. With very innovative choreography visually, like people are fighting with books and magazines and such. But the, the sound is what keeps them together. And I like the first time you saw it without the sound effects in it, did you were you excited or were you terrified? That's a good question. <laughs> I think we were really excited about it because, you know, the, this and this goes back for me. I think I remember when I bought the book. I bought this book that I knew nothing about. And it was the called, Robert Ludlum. Yeah, like born, it was Born books. Identity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I remember buying that book, started reading it, and couldn't put it down. And as a book, that was – I read a lot. And that was very specifically written and very – it grabbed you. So the, the movie had these certain elements. I think the idea that we as an audience, together with the character – got to realize bit by bit what he is that he doesn't know and we don't know and we have that experience together. That was really interesting to read and it also translates well into the movies. But also, when you find out about what he is, is that he's really well trained and the people that he meets are equally well trained. And that was one of these ideas that we had from the beginning. I'm, I have a big background in fighting of different kinds. And the, the thing that happens when somebody is precise is you don't waste energy on stuff that does not matter, including voice. So that the whole idea was that it always has to be straight to the point, simple, and breathing and efforts is more internal and short instead of these, you know, classic that you usually do in films. No, it, it, it was like two machines getting together to duke it out. And they both need, needed to preserve as much energy as possible. So every move has a point and it's all about clarity and it's all about efficiency so that was the first idea. So that's why the, the, the vocals in there is short, tight, if I may say, more professional than, than, than most. And then it comes to everything else in the fight scenes and, and how those were created because we knew a lot of times that it wasn't going to be music. So it has to, has to uphold itself. So you go through and you're trying to find, again, just like in the car chase, what's important. And there is shots in there that you could not see that a knife entered the fight, for instance. But once you hear it, all of a sudden you see it. So that was, again, our way. We needed to guide the audience to make sure they were 
could follow the fight, per se. And it's interesting, too, because the different sounds, because they were fighting with pens and knives and books and stuff and whatever comes up, which doesn't make it monotone. It shifts and changes all the time. Those we cut, you know, something that we do a lot is that we shoot foley for a scene, for instance. The foley editor will cut it and just put it in sync. Then that goes to the effects editor that's cutting the rest of the stuff. And it's, ne it's never two, again, not two separate entities. They're being cut together so that it, you have a foley impact on, right on top of the effects if needed, or you pick one or the other. And then it's crafted together in one room from the beginning. So by the time it comes to the dub stage, it has a very specific way of going. It's, it's not a bunch of stuff that you're sitting there sorting out. But also, because they're conceived and cut together, they actually work. And if they don't work together, they're not going to be there. So those decisions are being made in our cutting rooms before you get to the end. And then you do the same thing. You bring in the vocals, and it's, it's a puzzle to make this happen. And then you have Foley, ADR, production, sound effects, and then that beautiful glue of um, the sim People usually don't use movement track in Foley. That's one of those things that you have sitting on the fader if you need it for an ADR line or for the m and &E. And, and I go, no, that's part of the palette. And that, Karen would say, connective tissue. I say that it's same thing, this different word, but it ties it all together. The separation between movement track sits in the middle that glues it and makes it look real. Because if you have music playing through a fight, that takes care of that. Yeah. But when you don't, again, born was about making it sound real. That's what made it scary. That's what made it exciting. It wasn't that it was a wah, boom, bang. You know, it wasn't never like that. It was like, paf. And shortest distance, shortest, best way of doing it, that's what had to happen. So, so that's, uh, that was also a new thing to be able to hold that together and hold it working. So it needed to feel like you're there in the room with them. And you want to back off a little bit so you don't get in the way. There's also spots in the one of those fight, well, probably all of the fight scenes, but one that I noticed when I was re-watching it for this interview, they're fighting and one of the characters has a knife, cuts to a reverse shot and the knife's gone. And that's a problem, but sound solved the problem by you hear the knife fall, even though you never see the knife fall. Clank, clank, clank. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it was interesting to see that. I was like, uh, go sound, go. <laughs> but um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask is uh, when you're attacking these fight scenes and you have uh, these short, tight sounds. Yeah. There, there is a, especially when they're short and tight, it, there, it becomes rhythmic. Yeah. Did, did it go back and forth between picture to build those rhythms or were you slipping sync or maybe you don't remember this exact thing, but it, what are your thoughts on doing that type of thing? I think it, you know, one can't be done without the other. And in this case, it always starts with a picture editing. And again, in most, most of these, Chris had help with other people. You know, he had Rick Pearson in, he had other people helping out. But, you know, the main editor through these was Chris Rouse. And I don't know what else to say. He's really good at that. <laughs> and, and I think he had similar ideas as us that it needed to have a rhythm, it needed to work, and then we can take that and enhance it. And then when things are not making sense, like you mentioned about the knife, then we can figure that out to save that little thing. But that's, uh, you know, the fights, the car chases, they all had a rhythm. And on a pace that nobody's ever seen before. And on top of the fast cuts, the camera's moving all the time, and it's shaking. And that's what I said earlier, you know, if you look at it, you could get seasick because it's, there's not a focal point. There's nothing to hold on to because it's, um, you know, it's a whole different, whole different deal. Well, and it also influenced everything that came bef after it. 
it was very different at its time. Yeah. If anyone that is listening to this that might be younger that uh, is seeing it now for the first time, they might not understand how different it was at that time. So, like, I, I can imagine it being uh, super exciting when you first saw the way they were built and figuring out what the way to approach sound for that was because you didn't have anything to copy or draw on at that point. It was a new thing for sure. And you do did notice pretty rapidly after these. It took a while. But pretty rapidly, others realized that, you know, and I, I saw, I'm working on a film right now. I, uh, I'm watching a scene and I'm going like, well, I know where this idea came from. You know, that's a further idea of the same thing. And, you know, the, the, the big boys, like uh, the Bond movies, I think, had to kind of take, well, wait a second. I think we need to modernize. We have to go a little grittier and a little into it and more real in our films to make them timely and make them feel like they're competing. Because I think Bourne, like you said, changed how we thought about it and how it was done. And uh, many other things all of a sudden started to feel old-fashioned. Obviously, we've been talking about the kinetic scenes with the car chases, the fights and such. But there are also other scenes where that is all pulled back. I'm thinking of uh, in the first film, In the Field, yeah. where the gunshots go off and the, you just get to see this beautiful shot of the birds flying out of the field yeah, yeah. that adds a whole different element to that that it felt almost daring at the time. Like, this is an action sequence. Why are we watching birds flying from field? But it brought the whole scene up another level. It did, and you know, and I and I remember that. That's that's one of those great moments of Doug Lyman. This is a this is a Doug if there ever was one. <laughs> so we were working on that, and of course we cut. We see the birds, so we cut something for the birds, and then Doug comes in for playback. So we play back for him, and he goes like, "Well, guys, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but this is all about the birds. I need all you know. I need a bunch of birds. That's what it's all about." And then he leaves, and of course we're going like, well, it's not that many birds on screen, <laughs> but I guess if he wants that, you're right, and we'll do it. So we do another pass, and we add a bunch of birds. So a couple of hours later, Doug comes back in, we play the scene back again, and he's standing with this puzzled look on his face, and he goes, guys, what's up with all the birds? <laughs> but, but that was... so. Of course, we had to end up somewhere in the middle, right? But that's a typical Doug moment. But yeah, in his mind, that was what that moment, that was going to change that moment into something else, was those birds mm -hmm. and the feeling that you get. And it was, you know, I can't remember exactly, but you're sitting out there and it's kind of desolate and it's kind of, you know, serene in a sense. And then you have these characters that you know this is not good. They're both not leaving that field. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> One of them so, isn't leaving the field. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, good. And then another quiet moment that somehow, I don't even think this would be possible anymore in the world of social media and stuff, but when the second film came out, if anyone hasn't seen it yet, you're this far in. I'm going to ruin part of it for you. But uh, the female lead dies like 10 minutes into the movie. Yeah. That didn't seem like a possibility. So when she's shot and goes underwater, as a viewer, well, he's Jason Bourne. He's going to save her. Right. Yeah, of course. That, like, I'm not worried about this. And then all of a sudden, he just lets her float away, and you realize, oh, this is a different type of action film. Like, the, the female lead died 10 minutes into the movie. But that was not known until you sat in that theater. Like, somehow that, like, I had no idea that was going to happen. And the way that that film plays out in sound is there, there is a bit of music, but it's not overwhelming music. But it's all underwater sounds, and the swooshes somehow become musical. And it's a really emotional scene that is, a lot of that emotion is played through the underwater sounds. It, it is, and it, you know, I think it was shocking for everybody, even us working on it, that, you know, because the, the first movie ended, like you said, with her being the love interest that once they find each other at the end, you're just feeling good. And here they are starting the second movie. Life is great. They're in love. Everything's good. And bam, that is a game changer. And it was daring. You know, people still talk about that. How could you do that? <laughs> but they did. They did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. 
Do you remember anything about the underwater sounds that you did for that, or is that lost to time? It's it's somewhat lost, and I I know the feeling, but that was again was something that was the moment that needed to feel different, and it needed to feel as intense as it was, and at the same time, the way that the shots were, it had to have beauty to it too. Exactly. Yeah. And then his feeling and his thoughts about what comes next and how did that change him as a character and engaged him back in so it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of story in that little moment that makes sense there is moments that sticks out and and we've talked about car chases and fights sometimes it is how to get there and i think it's it's a great sequence when i believe he's in tangier mm -hmm. and it's been a cat and mouse game which we have in in a few of the films but in that one particular you move through this environment when you hear a offstage baby crying somewhere and you you have the all these local world sounds around you that creeps and still stare, and it, and it builds a tension in a sense, but it also places you at this place very specifically. So you, you can close your eyes and you can imagine what it looks like. And it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. So when the fight starts, it's, it happens fast. And again, back to that, right? It's, it's now life and death. Definitely, yeah. But I think he jumps right through a window and they yeah, start fighting right yeah, away, yeah. 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 But leading up to that jump, it's this great sequence that sets you up in beauty and kind of suspense and it's calm and it's, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is then the payoff when you come to the fight because then you have the contrast and the dy dynamic shift, if you will, both visually and sound -wise. Yeah, it goes from expansive to yeah. very, very tight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. So the the last question I have for you is about the opposite of Jason Bourne which is the control room at the, uh, the CIA. Yeah. These scenes are just people standing in a room looking at computer monitors. Yeah. And yet, it's, they're super tense scenes. And if you take a moment to really listen to the soundtrack in there, there's an insane amount of typing happening. There's no way they all could type that much. And there is a lot of dialogue happening underneath the main character's dialogue. Yeah. Which is a fairly unusual thing for a film to have dialogue on dialogue like that right was that a plan from the beginning how did that approach evolve i think i think if you if you if you reverse it and you think about if you had played those scenes basically with the dialogue that was exchanged by the main characters that would have give you one level but it's sometimes we do it with music sometimes we do it with effects you start crowding it with feeling it could be that it's stuff that makes you uncomfortable it could be, you know, in that case, the activity level is somewhat frenetic. And I think as an audience member, a lot because a lot of stuff that we do, it's not that the, the average audience member doesn't look at it like you do. Yeah. And you kind of look at it, oh, that's interesting. And you might analyze it and see, wonder what that would do and all that kind of stuff. What an audience feels is an instinctual feeling to, you know, we kind of put them in a different place in a different time or in a certain feeling. And that intense stuff behind it makes us all go a little bit because you can feel the energy and the frenetic energy that sits underneath the dialogue. So now all of a sudden you have the dialogue that's being spoken, but you have this energy field around them of activity and you know that the world is ticking away in this command center, in the sense that sends things out to wherever it needs to go and coming back. And that's, that's uh, I think it's one of those that we sometimes underestimate, you know, that, that instinctual feeling that an audience gets. And we, you know, then if we do it right, we can manipulate the audience to feel something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Mm -hmm. And it's nice when you can do that on the dialogue and the effect side. Because it's obvious sometimes with music, right? But it's not so obvious when we do it. I remember those scenes. There was a lot of 
a lot of working on those. I sure. believe it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it also takes bravery from the team and the director and maybe even the producers in this case, because I've worked on things where we've tried similar things and there's a lot of pushback. Pull that down. Pull that down. We need the main dialogue to be super yeah. clear. We need the na- main dialogue to be super clear. And not, not that they, it wasn't in this picture, but there was more of a push than I've seen in other things. So yeah. to get permission to do that, did you have to play it for them or were they on board from the beginning? Or You know, I can't remember specifically about that, but I think, again, as a team, the, way, the ones that we worked together with the mixers and, again, Chris Rouse, we, we were all involved all the time making sure that things balanced out. And uh, that's... Uh, it's a question how, how much you can crowd it before you start losing something. Mm-hmm. And dialogue is always, in my book, is always number one. You know, I, when the last times when you run through a movie and you take notes, 95% of them, for me, the notes that I have is dialogue notes. If you're missing part of a word or you're missing a word, you never want to do that. You always want to keep that. So... How much you can, in a scene like that, how much can you crowd it before you start getting into danger zone? We don't seem to have a problem crowding dialogue with music. So my reply to that would be, why can't we do that with all the other stuff? And if it's not stuff that sticks out that you actually start to listen to, so you've got to, when you do it, you have to do it in a way that it's not poking stuff out that you think as an audience, I should hear what he's saying or how, what... No, it's, it's supposed to be so broad and so much and such an energy that it just sits there. Then your mind can separate that from the dialogue that you're supposed to hear, I think. Awesome. Thank you very much for talking to me about this. I, I think you can probably tell I'm a big fan of this series of films. I am too. Uh, yeah, we all are. Everybody who's seen it, I think, blown away by them at the time. So thank you for talking to me about it today. Big thanks to Formosa and uh, Jack, Pat, and Erica for helping set up this talk. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we can have you on again for something that you're working on in the future. It would be great. Sounds great to me. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Nice meeting you. I really enjoyed talking with Pear. This was a really fun one. We were originally scheduled to talk with both Pear and his co-supervising sound editor, Karen Baker Landers. But sadly, Karen was sick that day and could not join us. I will endeavor to make sure we have her on in the future to make up for this, though. Once again, a big thanks to the folks at Formosa Hollywood for hosting Tonebenders for this talk, especially Erica Wunsch, who is amazing. This episode was volunteer edited by Matthew Mutton, who is a pleasure to work with. Matthew is based in the UK, and his sonic adventure is just beginning. He has finished college studying sound for visual media and is now working on his dreams by helping people with their passion projects and indie films. He's doing mixing, editing, and sound design as a freelancer, and he can be found on Twitter at Matt Mutton Sound. Go check him out. Our next few episodes are going to be amazing, so please keep an ear out for them. Please help us spread the word about Tonebenders by telling your friends in the sound community what we are up to. On behalf of Pear Halberg, my name is Tim Muirhead. Thanks for listening to Tonebenders. Talk to you soon. Tonebenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio related podcasts to listen to? Tonebenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. 